We're going to talk about UFOs. Now, this is an area that uh, most people tend to relegate to the demented or incompetent or fringe type people. And yet, uh, the entertainment industry, of course, has uh, picked up on this with the uh, 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 crop circle thing called Signs, which may, many uh, may have seen. And also, uh, Steven Spielberg did a mini series called Taken, focusing on the abductions and so forth. And uh, while these things are interesting entertainment, they are replete, of course, with all kinds of misinformation and, and uh, legends and uh, half-truths that get mingled with facts so that it's uh, really just entertainment. But one of the things you and I have to face is, uh, what is the real reality here? Is this just a bunch of nonsense, a, a composite of hoaxes and, and pranks by various people through the years? Or is there something really going on? One of the things we want to explore a little tonight is, are the UFOs real? And if so, where are they from? What's their agenda? Are they friendly or hostile? And uh, more, most important, what does the Bible say about them? So we're going to explore that tonight as we go forth on our exp exploration of UFOs and the strange term, the Nephilim. Uh, what is that all about? But before we start, since we are dealing with a very, very complicated area, an area where many of us have already formed opinions, let me remind you of the, there's a principle. According to Edmund Spencer, he, he articulated this, there's a principle which is a bar against all information. It's proof against all argument. And it's something which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation before investigation. So one of our challenges as we go into this very complicated topic is to set aside our prejudices and presuppositions and let's see what we can uh, find out. Now, the same idea is not only uh, articulated by Edmund Spencer, but it also is in our uh, uh, collection of Proverbs by Solomon, who reminds us that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So one of our challenges tonight is sort of set aside what we think we may have heard or what, we, what our basic prejudices are, and let's see what we can find out that might be new. Now, many of us, of course, have seen photographs, many of which are hoaxes, contrived, and so forth. Uh, there are many of these in the literature. I'm sure you've seen all kinds. Uh, the problem is, is that not all of them are. It may surprise you to learn that there are over 3,000 authenticated photographs in the classified community that are uh, authenticated. So what's really going on here? See, the, the problem we have in researching this area is there is so much that's uncorroborated. There's a lot of deliberate disinformation and certainly a lot of data which is unreliable. And uh, the problem is when you strip away the hoaxes and you strip away the nonsense and you set aside the uncorroborated, there still is too much to ignore that is substantiated that involves multiple reliable witnesses, including multiple radar sightings. And uh, radars generally don't have hallucinations. And uh, this idea of being plotted simultaneously on multiple radars is something that should get our attention. And uh, now, I'll give you one example. Back in, on June 18th of 1997, there was a strange vehicle that appeared over Phoenix, Arizona. In fact, went over most of the state at about 30 miles an hour, which is very slow for an airborne vehicle. There were some that said they felt they could have hit it with a, a, a ball. It seemed that close as it went over. And it created quite a stir. And um, on March 13th, there were, there were uh, uh, sightings. Uh, all the way uh, from Casa Grande and Chandler, all the way up through uh, the northern part of the state, Prescott and so forth. So there was a, it wasn't just a local phenomenon, and uh, it created quite a stir. Now, the governor of Arizona made a big mistake by treating a press conference the following morning lightly as humor. And it didn't go over very well because people were upset because they were getting stonewalled by the government. Uh, even though there were denials by the Air Force, they saw the fighter jets... Uh, 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 sorry after them and so on, so it, it created quite a stir. It wasn't picked up in the national media. It was picked up, of course, substantially in the local media, that is in the state of Arizona. 
And uh, one of the things that's strange about this is that it happened in March of, of, uh, uh, of 1997. It didn't show up until June 18th. And for, what's, what's strange to me is not just the event that happened in March, but there was no word about it in the national media. But then for some reason, some no obvious reason, on uh, June 18th, it was on the front page of USA Today. That's where this picture came from. It was on the, uh, NBC, CBS, CNN, all the major networks had this brief comment about what happened, what was puzzling about it. It didn't happen on June 18th. It happened back in March. And I haven't been able to determine what triggered the news media to make it a big event at that time. It's one thing it does demonstrate is how the news is managed, because all the networks pick it up at the same time uh, for no ostensible reason. Um, but as we talk about these kinds of things, sooner or later, we have to focus on the Roswell incident. And uh, many of you realize that approximately July 4th, a few days following maybe, some object, that's in 1947, some object landed near Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, Sheriff George Wilcox contacted the Roswell Army Airfield um, regarding wreckage that was discovered on Max Brazel's ranch or in, in that area. The Army seals off the area and confiscates everything that was there. And uh, on, on the 8th of July, uh, Colonel William Blanchard, who was commander of the 509th Bomb Group, that was our primary atomic bomb group in those days, uh, he issued an official press release stating that the wreckage of a crashed disk had been recovered. Now this press release went out early enough on July 8th to be picked up by 30 newspapers across the country. And so it is. And this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, what it looks like. The RAAF uh, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region and so forth. And no details of flying disc are revealed, etc., etc. Except within hours, something very strange happens. A second press release, which it tried to rescind the first one, was issued from the office of Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was commander of the 8th Air Force. At, and it, uh, he resides at Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield in Texas, which is about 400 miles away from the incident. But within hours, General Ramey issues a countermanding release, and he claimed that Colonel Blanchard and the officers of the 5 and 9th uh, at Roswell had made an unbelievably foolish mistake that somehow they incorrectly identified a weather balloon and its radar reflector as the wreckage of a crashed disk. Now, frankly, everyone that heard this, that thought about it a little bit, realized that was just a very uh, uh, contrived cover story. And uh, 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 it, he, this press release that, in effect, hit the next day by General Ramey uh, caused, you know, it was in effect a denial, uh, did not explain why they confiscated everything, why the whole subject has been classified to this day. And uh, now that, what that really did, this absurd cover story, frankly, just fueled the uh, 50 years the intervening 50 years of conjectures and all kinds of anecdotal testimonies of people who were involved peripherally. All kinds of stories have been echoing uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, this half century that's transpired since uh, July of 1947. And the stories typically maintain that there were four alien occupants of this uh, 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 disk, that for three of them were dead, one was still alive, all these presumably were taken off to the, uh, uh, the Never Never Land of military security, and there's all kinds of stories that are too preposterous to really accept, and yet uh, it continues. The great mystery about, uh, uh, well, every, when I travel, one of the most often questions I get is, what really happened at Roswell? Well, we don't really know what happened at Roswell. It's been classified, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We do know something that happened nine months after the Roswell incident. Al Gore was born. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it turns out he really was. The Roswell incident occurred nominally about July 
uh, the days following July 4th in 1947. His birthday is March 31st of 1948, and that makes it a cute quip because every audience has always seemed to enjoy that kind of a crack. And obviously, I'm not being serious uh, uh, that there's a linkage, really. But um, in any case, there is one reason I want to dwell on this a little bit because for 50 years, people have conjectured what really happened there, and the Air Force has contrived one thin cover story after another over the years, each one sillier than the first, each one easily refuted by anyone that does a little homework. So you wonder, why is this thing still classified? Several presidents and uh, half a dozen congressmen have tried to crack the security surrounding Roswell to no avail. What could have happened there? that is still to this day regarded as an item of national security. And uh, now, f interestingly enough, just in the last uh, few months, there appears that we now have what some people would call the smoking gun. There is some tangible evidence that's finally emerged that there was a crash of some kind, and it did have victims of some sort. You see, when General Ramey at Fort Worth issued that cover story, there were, the press was present and many pictures were taken. And James Bond Johnson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram was among them. And on July 8th, he took a photograph, which a number of the photographs happened to show General Ramey clutching a sheaf of papers in his hand that apparently was a communique to Washington, D.C. And he happened to have that in his hand while he was going through this explanation and, and demonstrating that this really was a weather balloon. They had some props there that they showed and so forth. Well, it turns out that was in July 47. Since 1947, we've made a lot of progress in digital imaging technology. And this sheaf of paper that was uh, uh, photographed was analyzed with a, dig uh, a, a digital photo scanner and enlarged and, and enhanced the words printed on the folded piece of paper. And then using a program for digital enhancement and analysis, it's now been reported on Associated Press on November 22nd of the year 2002, uh, that uh, David Rudiak was able to identify several key phrases on that sheaf of paper that General Ramey was clutching during that press conference. There's a phrase, the victims of the wreck, and also the phrase, in the disk they will ship. Lots of other words that were uh, hard, to, you know, more conjectural is what they said, but the point is here's a communication in his hand going to Washington that speaks of victims of the wreck and speaks of a disc that they're going to ship while he's covering the story that, that, that uh, Colonel uh, you know, Blanchard was all mixed up. This is just a weather balloon. So finally, the, the UFO researchers have something tangible to go on because up till now it's been a spooky thing. Let's shift a little bit from 47 to July 19th through the 26th, about a week, in 1952. I happen to remember this vividly because in June 30th of 1952 I was entering the United States Naval Academy so I was a plebe, uh, or I should say yeah, a plebe at, um, uh, at Annapolis uh, when this was in the papers and much talked about at the time. It turns out a number of UFOs harassed Washington National Airport which in those days was the only airport there who didn't have Dulles, this is before Dulles and uh, also Andrews Air Force Base so badly they had to shut down the air traffic. And this went on and off and on for a week. And it was in the papers because every time the Air Force would alert jets to investigate what these things were, they would disappear. As soon as the jets landed, they came back. And uh, uh, fiery objects overrun jets over Capitol in the Washington Post. These are headlines from that period. Now, one of the things there again they never really explained it. They issued some cover stories, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't just an incident one night. It went off and on for the better part of a week. Again, a mis it created a problem just in blocking all the phone traffic because everybody's calling what's going on and so forth, and, and so something real was happening because you're talking here multiple radars. This isn't some you know, impressionable, uh, unprofessional observer. This was uh, the Air Force Air Controllers at the Washington National and Andrews Air Force Base and uh, never explained, at least not to the public. 1993, that there, you know, by the way, there are thousands of these things to select from. I've just picked a few that seem representative. Yeah, over in Mexico City in 1993, the population by the thousands were uh, upset and disturbed by what went on. 
Seoul, South Korea, November 23rd of 1996. CNN and Reuters reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised for 10 minutes on national television. You know, when we talk about witnesses, there's all kinds of people, many very reliable professionals that have contributed to this background, but the ones that you and I would tend to presume would be the most reputable, most trained, and most uh, competent in this area would be our astronauts. You think they know something about it. Do you realize that 13 of them have gone on record uh, of seeing UFOs while they were doing their missions? Uh, Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14. April 1996, and it was, this was on uh, Dateline NBC. He said, NASA <clears throat> is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico. See, this isn't just the presumption of some journalists or the, or the tabloids at the check, you know, checkout stands in the market. These, <laughs> these are serious people saying that something is being covered up. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has made many talks. On May 15th of 1963, he did the 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO, which was also at the same time he saw it tracked by, our, uh, by the radar in Australia. It corroborated this. And he's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. And uh, in May 1996, he said, we are being visited by aliens. So he's, settled, he's spoken a lot about this, so much so that some people tend to write him off. James Lovell. Frank Borman, <coughs> Borman, excuse me, Gemini 7, December 1965, on the second orbit of their two-week flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the stage of their own Titan booster, but they indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so that doesn't quite jive. Walter Schirra, these are all familiar names to most of us. Mercury 8, 1968, he was the first guy to use the term Santa Claus to indicate UFOs are near the space capsule. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, it was about December, so everybody thought that this was just a cute quip, but it was a code word. And this was, it was later uh, in 1979, Maurice Chatelain, the chief of NASA communications, confirmed that the Santa Claus phrase was a prearranged code word to deal with the UFOs without alarming the public. And uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, are these familiar names to you? Are these guys competent? On Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on a crater, and there, there are unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Some of this is classified, gets classified quickly, so we're, tra we're treading on dangerous ground. But they have said two large objects were watching them. And Armstrong is quoted in some reports of a CIA cover-up. Now, those reports get uh, squelched, of course, so you, it's hard to separate what was just you know, urban legend and what really happened. But if you go to Ed White, James McDivitt, James Lovell, Borman, Shira, Gordon Cooper, these guys are all, have all reported UFOs. Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, Ned Mitchell, Apollo 14, and on it goes. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He also was a relatively recent resident of the Russian Mir space station this a few years ago. Uh, March 24th of 1989, an amateur radio operator picked up an exer uh, a, a intercept. About, uh, said, Houston, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observation. And uh, very impressive to listen to that soundtrack and hear if the familiar voice uh, say these rather strange things. So UFOs, we could go on and on. The main point I'm trying to do at this point is just indicate there are some people that you would consider competent and reliable in multiple names that are reporting these things are real. And I would not attribute all of these to hallucinations or being impressionable or what have you. In fact, if you start looking into this area as an area of research, you'll find it extremely difficult because there are 6,000 professional publications in English alone that deal with this. There are 2,200 foreign publications, 1,350 UFO-related periodicals. And some of these, if you look at the books in the library, there are over 700 books that deal with UFOs just in the period from the 17th century to the First World War. Excuse me, the Second World War, from 1650 to about 1945. There are over 300 books prior to the 17th century that deal with UFOs in the ancient times. So what on earth is this all about? You know, they've done polls. Do you realize that 57% of Americans, according to the polls, believe in UFOs? That's 
doesn't make them real, but it says there's some phenomenology that must be real, even if just perceptions. 15% of Americans believe they have seen a UFO. How many of you in the audience have seen a UFO at one time? Okay, we're not going to take names. I just care. Oh, good, okay. Here's the shocking one. This blew me away when I first ran into it. The, the, somewhere between 1 and 3 percent, various, various polls agree, somewhere between 1 and 3 percent of Americans claim that they have had an abduction experience. That's over 5 million people, or in that neighborhood. Not a few thousand deranged people, not a few, you know, disaffected. This is, uh, we'll talk a little more about this. This is a, this is a very, very disturbing phenomenon in the, cons in the counseling uh, profession. Now, part of the problem of the UFOs is they have some paradoxical behavior. On the one hand, they're seen by multiple competent witnesses. They are plotted on radar, sometimes multiple radars simultaneously. They leave tangible traces on the ground, sometimes radiation, evidence of burning, and other things. So they are apparently real in the sense of being physical, on the one hand. There are photographs. Sometimes they show up on photographs, sometimes they don't. But here's the problem. They do, while they seem to be tangible on the one hand, they exhibit behavior that can't possibly be physical. They can go in excess of 6,000 miles per hour without sonic boom. So what on earth does that mean? I'd like to know how they do that trick. They've been plotted making right angle turns at over 16,000 miles an hour. That defies the laws of physics. That's a, now the more, and, and the, perhaps the most disturbing thing of all, they appear to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize without a trace. One of the great mysteries of the UFOs isn't seeing them, is trying to figure out where are they when you don't see them. Some people say, well, they're from another galaxy. There's lot, uh, most physicists will debunk that for lots of reasons. They seem to pose that way, but for lots of, if they came, you know, if, they, if there are that many coming from another galaxy, you think you'd sense the traffic. We'll come to back with some more reasonable explanations, and you're going to discover. The, the two top researchers in the, in the last century, really, is uh, Jacques Vallée, France, and uh, J. Allen Hynek, the American. Now, J. Allen Hynek was uh, head of astronomy at, at Cornell, and he set out to debunk this nonsense about UFOs, and he became one of the most ardent, competent, balanced researchers in the trade. Jay Allen Hynek, he, he died a few years ago. Uh, uh, those of you that saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, whether you realize or not, saw J. Allen Hynek because he, he was in the crowd. Uh, I was on the board in those days with Alan Adler from Columbia, and, and uh, they had him as just a gesture appear in some of the scenes, just as, a, as an extra. And uh, uh, the lacum of that, uh, of that piece of fiction, of course, was patterned after Jacques Vallée, the Frenchman. Both of these respected researchers came to the conclusion that they're not intergalactic. For lots of physics, there are a lot of physical, uh, physics rebuttals to that conjecture. They both argued that these things are demonic. Their term. They've written many, many books. You can check them out. These are not uh, uh, religious people. They're not people with any kind of personal agenda. But they came to the conclusion that these things, on the one hand, and, and by the way, we, we take for granted that we strip away the nonsense and the hoaxes, set that aside. There's tens of thousands of files you have to wallow through. When you, when you cut through all that, there's still a core group, a substantial core group, of real events that need explanation. And uh, so on the one hand, they exhibit physical properties. On the one hand, on the other hand, they also violate all physical laws. And so the conclusion from that both J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée and others have come to is that they're hyperdimensional, that somehow they come from another dimension periodically. That causes us now to stand back a little bit and, and do a little tutorial on uh, hyperspaces. And, uh, uh, and, and we're going to get into uh, why we feel that the Bible is an authenticated message of extraterrestrial origin in the first place. So let's talk a little about hyperspaces. There are only two kinds of, a hyperspace, by the way, just a term for a space of more than three dimensions. You and I are familiar with two-dimensional space. It's called a scratch pad or a, a, a photograph or a piece of paper as a two-dimensional representation of something, typically. 
uh, three-dimensional space we're familiar with because we live in it and we also build models in three dimensions. We probably have a vague feeling of a fourth dimension called time. We don't get too comfortable with that unless you've done some special study, but we sort of acknowledge that reluctantly. Hyperspaces, frankly, is just the term used to study spaces of more than three dimensions. And we discover there's only two kinds of people that can really relate to hyperspaces. And that's mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? Because they haven't the... Uh, their, their prejudice has been blindfolded, so to speak. Now, the one book that is second to the Bible in its publication, all of us know the Bible is the most uh, uh, popular book in the history of man, but the second to that would be Euclid. And that's where most of us have been taught in school. And most of us, when we went to school, had trigonometry or, or plane geometry, same subject in a sense. Uh, we all know that a triangle, if you add up the angles, a triangle adds, a, adds up to how much? Anyone? 180 degrees, you betcha. So if I have a 30, 60, 90, it adds up 180. If I have a 45, 45, 90, in fact, any triangle, if I add up the, the angles, it would add up to 180. Suppose, though, that my partner and I went out to a large field here. And we, and we very carefully laid out with the transit a very large triangle. And when we got back with our uh, figures, we added up the three angles, and it added up to more than 180 degrees. What would you conclude? That we'd messed up, huh? No, what, we've, what, we, what have we encountered? Anyone? The curvature of the Earth, exactly. See, if you take a course in navigation, one of the things that you'll have to get some background in is spherical trigonometry, where you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And so, see, when, when we, this little rule that we all learned that a triangle, you know, a, 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 by, by implication, a plane triangle, a, a, a flat plane, adds up to 180 degrees, that's only true for a universe of two dimensions. So when you find that rule violated, it's a hint that you've encountered an additional dimension. And uh, so, uh, if, uh, uh, Dr. Einstein made history with that insight. Because he was grappling, of course, with the nature of, of space, and, and uh, he realized that length, mass, velocity, and time are relative to the velocity of an observer. Uh, in 1915, he generalized that, basically discovered that there's no distinction between time and space. And perhaps the most important thing from the th general theory of relativity, we don't, we don't get in the math, of course, but it to, is to realize that time itself is a physical property. You and I do not live in three dimensions. We live in at least four. In fact, we now discover much more than that. But uh, this idea that Einstein recognized as he grappled with the properties of space that there's a, an additional dimension required, and he went to four dimensions to resolve the time issue. And uh, his theory of relativity has been uh, uh, confirmed over 12 different methods to over 14 decimals. So it's no longer really a theory. Uh, it's 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 well-accepted basis in... Uh, in certain fields of science. So when we go, be, we need to go beyond Euclid, which of course deals just with three dimensions. And uh, in June 10th of, 19, of 1854, the most important lecture in mathematics was given by George Riemann. He invented a thing called metric tensors. And uh, that tool that he developed proves to be one of the most profound tools um, in advanced physics. And it took uh, uh, over 50 years in fact, over 60 years, for Dr. Einstein to use that tool to develop his four-dimensional space-time. And it's too bad that Einstein went to his death frustrated by not being able to solve certain problems, which if he had applied the technique going to five or more dimensions, they would have yielded. It took his successors to do that. Because in 1953, Kaluza and Klein both developed more than four-dimensional uh, models, which integrated light and supergravity. Uh, in, in, the, in a model. In 1963, 10 years later, Yang and Mills both developed what they call Yang-Mills fields, which reconcile electromagnetic and nuclear forces that physicists are pursuing some way to integrate all that we know about the physical universe into a common model. And uh, so the, in, uh, in uh, as early as eight, 1984, and it's still a current conjecture because there's a lot still problems with it, but uh, scientists now generally believe that you and I live not in three or four or five, but in ten dimensions. And uh, 
they, 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 you, if you read in this area, you'll encounter su uh, super strings and such, and I won't get, we have briefing packs on this for those that want to get into it more. The point being, we need to understand that the three dimensions you and I are familiar with are not all there is, there's more. Let's imagine, you and I can't move up. It'd be futile for me to try to communicate four, five, six dimensions to us without, to get together without having more mathematical tools. But what we can do is we can go the other way, and it may stretch our horizons here a little bit. You and I are three-dimensional beings. Let's imagine a two-dimensional world. That would be as like a, a large tabletop or a large flat plane. Now, and let's imagine that two-dimensional world populated by two-dimensional people. You and I could come along and poke our finger through the plane of their existence. And what would they see? They would see a circle. They'd only see that which they could relate to in their universe. But if, we're, if we as a three-dimensional being are putting our finger through that uh, uh, two-dimensional universe to the two-dimensional people in the two-dimensional universe, they would simply see a circle. Well, in fact, let's imagine that a ball fell through that two-dimensional universe. To the two-dimensional observer in that two-dimensional universe, he'd see from nothing to a point, it would be, it'd grow to a large circle, and then it would shrink back to a point and disappear. He wouldn't be able to relate to what happened because he doesn't have the, the insight of, of that third dimension. You with me so far? Now, if you had some other kind of a shape, say a tumbling cube, it also would go through and it would take odd shapes as it passed through and then disappear. So one of the problems we have, suppose, if, suppose you and I are going to try to communicate a three-dimensional object to that two-dimensional world. How would we go about it? Well, there's a couple of ways. One would be to do what the what a, a architect would call projection. For example, if we had a cube, we could, in effect, shine a light that would give you a profile of that in two dimensions. And you discover very quickly that that works, but it's not too useful in, in letting the two-dimensional person understand a three-dimensional cube. So there's another way you could do it. You could take a, a three-dimensional cube, and you could unravel it. You could take it and just unfold it and lay it out, and that would be a way to communicate to this two-dimensional person what this three-dimensional cube is like. But you'd quickly discover as you tried to do that, his understanding is likely to be incomplete. You say, Chuck, what do you, what's all this got to do with anything? Well, <clears throat> let's talk about a four-dimensional cube. That's called in mathematics a Hinton cube, and uh, there are such things. Um, the, on, the only place I know of it, it's called a tesseract. That's an unraveled Hinton cube. This is a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three dimensions. You say, gee, what, what good is that? There's only one place I know of where this has actually been used constructively. And amazingly enough, it was by Salvador Dali. I never realized what a sophisticated mathematician he was, but in, in uh, his Corpus Christi painting, he actually has Christ on a four-dimensional cube as a cross, in, implying his mastery over time as well as space. And uh, I imagine there's probably not one observer in a hundred that really understands the sophistication that Salvador Dali was demonstrating by this piece of abstract art. But that's a Hinton cube or a tesseract. And that's the, but anyway, let's get back to hyperspaces then. The main point I want to get across, you and I live in three spatial dimensions, and that time is a physical property. That's very important to us in our ministry because we know that the Bible is an integrated message, 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years, and yet it's integrated, and not just thematically. The very design of the text itself evidences uh, integration. But what's mysterious about that, that integration also implies that the origin of that message is from outside the dimensionality of time because of the nature of its structure, its use of, it, uh, of writing history be, before it happens, and so forth. So that's very important. Now, in particle physics, uh, they talk about ten-dimensional strings as the nature of our universe. What fascinates me about that is that that's exactly what two Hebrew scholars back in the 13th century, excuse me, 12th century, predicted just from their study of Genesis 1 is that we live in ten dimensions, four, are, four dimensions are knowable, and six are not knowable, to use their jargon. But in any case, the, the suggestion, it's the only one that we've encountered that really can reconcile what we think we know, is that the UFOs apparently are hyperdimensional. 
They apparently can enter our dimensional under certain conditions for certain periods of time. And uh, so let's see. Uh, now there's another aspect I'd like to touch upon about the, the, the whole UFO area. And getting back to the Roswell thing, why on earth is Roswell still classified? Why can't the American public or the world public be informed about what's really going on? It's all, it's all tightly classified. Well, back in 1984, an event occurred that uh, deserves some comment. In 1984, several documents emerged within the UFO community. One was a briefing addressed to President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower by Re uh, Rear Admiral Roscoe Hill Hillencutter, and it was dated 18 November 1952. And there was also a special classified executive order signed by Harry S. Truman. To the Secretary of Defense in those days was James Forrestal. It was dated 24 September 1947. And his letter apparently authorized him to establish a board of suitably qualified persons to be answerable directly and only to the president. And the code name for this august group of appointees was Majestic 12. That was the code name. And these documents, all kinds of documents show up, uh, CIA documents and other things, including this memo that signed by Harry Truman uh, uh, establishing this, this august group. Now who were these, who were this, these group called Majestic 12? Well, one, of course, was James, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, who was prominent in those days, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who was probably the most famous scientist uh, of the period, General Nathan Twining, head of the Air Force, General Hoyt Vandenberg, Robert, General Robert Montague, and a number of civilians that you may not have heard of, Dr. Detlef Bronk, Dr. Jerome Hunsucker, Mr. Sidney Sowers, Mr. Gordon Gray, and uh, Dr. Lloyd Berkner, and one guy we will talk about a little bit is Dr. Donald Menzel. And uh, these were, uh, it, it, when Forstall died, by the way, in 49, General uh, 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 Walker Smith replaced him. But these 12 people apparently were known in the classified community, it would seem, as Majestic 12. Well, these are interesting people. You see, uh, of these 12, of 12 people, it was Secretary of Defense, of course, three of these people were the first three directors of the Central CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Actually, at, uh, the, the director of Central Intelligence, that was the successor to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which later became the CIA. Five of these people were top scientists in aviation, research and development, and astronomy. All of these people held the highest security clearances anyway. Let's talk a little bit about Admiral Hill and Cutter. He was not, turns out, he was not simply a Navy man. And by the way, I want to mention something. Uh, a lot of people have heard about Majestic 12. And a lot of people also understand that it's been all debunked. But we're indebted to a very, very patient, thorough, diligent researcher by the name of Stanton Friedman, who published a book on this. And what he did, uh, well, uh, uh, he, he developed dossiers, spent 20 years developing dossiers on each of the 12 to try to understand as much as he could about their personal lives. Rear Admiral Hillencotter was not simply a Navy man, he was the first director of the CIA, which was also established, inter interestingly enough, in September of 1947, just months after the Roswell incident. He retired from the U.S. Navy in 57, and soon was appointed the, on the board of governors of NICAP, which was considered the most influential UFO organization in the 50s and 60s. Dr. Vannevar Bush, this is a name you probably heard, he's a world-renowned research scientist. He was the head of MIT between the two world wars and head of the Office of Scientist, uh, uh, Scientific Research and Development. He led the development of the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, radar, and a hundred other high-tech uh, systems with military applications. See, that's why he's so well known. He was also well known for establishing a policy of compartmentalization of classified work. It was previously the style in research labs to give people a lot of freedom of movement. And he was the one that saw the need for compartmentalizing, letting scientists have only the information they need to know so that they could control the, the, the uh, 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 transit of information uh, within the organization. So this whole idea of, we're going to talk about compartmentalization here shortly. 
Well, this whole MJ-12 thing, there are two kinds of people, those that have never heard of MJ-12, and those that know that it's just, uh, been de it was just a hoax. You see, somebody noticed that the, apparently that the typewriter that was used to type the Truman Executive Order of 1947 was deemed a Smith Corona model that had not been manufactured until 1963. So you start to smell a hoax, if that's true. The signature on the uh, memo <coughs> excuse me, the signature on the memorandum had apparently been photocopied from an unrelated letter that Truman wrote to Vannevar Bush back, uh, uh, written in uh, 1st of October of 1947. So you get the impression this thing was just a hoax. There are other anomalies that were noted and published in various media. So it quickly, within the UFO community, in just a few years, it was recognized by everyone that these documents were just fakes. And so most people either never heard of MG-12 or they, quote, know, close quote, that it was just a, a very elaborate hoax. Until Friedman comes along. Stanton Friedman, he was a nuclear physicist. He spent over a decade painstakingly probing 15 libraries and archives and he now has cast significant doubts about the doubters. He has refuted most of the documentation quibbles that were raised by the skeptics, but more importantly, he compiled detailed dossiers on each of the 12, and he's made some intriguing discoveries. See, by collecting the details on each one, some very interesting corroborations have emerged. And these are all published in his book, uh, Top Secret Magic, uh, in 1996. Let's take General Nathan Twining as an example. He had been scheduled to fly to Seattle on July 16th of 1947 to review the new B-50 bomber that was being built by Boeing at that time, and also to do some fishing with some old friends. So that was all scheduled for some time. Suddenly, General Twining canceled his Seattle trip and headed for New Mexico on July 7th. This is billed as just a routine inspection, but that doesn't jibe with the apparent urgency to upset all these other long-laid plans for no apparent uh, specific reason. It's also interesting that on July 9th, President Truman met with New Mexico Senator Chavez um, uh, with no reason given. So you get the feeling behind these calendar entries there's something going on. Another interesting guy is Donald Menzel. He apparently, Friedman discovers, had a, led a double life as a UFO debunker and a distinguished astronomer in public. He was a well-known astronomer. He also ran around poking holes at these UFO conjectures that were going on in those days. But it turns out he was also a linguist, a cryptographer, and a consultant to the National Security Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency for more than 30 years, and this was not known in the public. There's something Stanton found out by doing his homework. He held a top secret ultra clearance and none of this was known to the general public. So it's interesting, whoever contrived this hoax had a lot of inside information somehow. Now it's also provocative, as Dr. Menzel, he gave some technical explanations disputing some UFO incidents that often were not scientifically defendable, especially for a guy like him who is a competent technologist. So it it's, it's strongly suggestive that he had a private agenda of disinformation as part of his job. So at this point, it may be useful to highlight, again, this is a little tutorial, which I'm going to call the anatomy of secrecy. How do you make something secret within the government or military community? Well, the first thing, you can, you can define the content of what's going on as secret or top secret or whatever level just, is justified by the content of the material. If there's a contract, the content of the work can be classified secret, top secret, what have you. But let's assume you're really serious about making this especially secure. The other thing you can do is called compartmental, uh, compartmentalization. You can compartmentalize the project. And how do you do that? You make the existence of the contract classified. And uh, they, these are uh, usually in the intelligence community, and that's why they're, they go by a nickname. They're called black programs from the intelligence uh, side. Uh, these, are, these are great contracts to get because your competitors don't know they exist. So they're sole source, and uh, they're considered attractive uh, contracts. See, I, I have served as chairman of the board of f four different publicly traded defense contractors. And uh, uh, several of these were uh, companies that d had their primary commitments in deeply classified work and uh, obviously included compartmentalized programs. 
But I have to tell you, I was startled. I spent 30 years in the strategic community, both in the Department of Defense community directly and also, as I say, uh, on boards and, uh, uh, of, uh, of publicly traded defense contractors. And I have to tell you, it was, was late in that 30-year career that I discovered, much to my amazement, there is another level of security, and that's where you make the existence of the customer classified. And I was uh, in one of those pro uh, projects, and uh, the, the, uh, it was a very, very strange meeting. We had a, uh, uh, our little company that uh, uh, was publicly traded, but not a large company, uh, was competing for a, a particular uh, procurement. And uh, the, the head of that particular division asked me, as chairman of the board and controlling shareholder, and, uh, and uh, 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 so on, to, 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 to be president of the meeting, along with our banker, the vice president of... Uh, First Interstate Bank uh, was there, and uh, as we in this conference room, um, three guys come in with business cards and give us their business cards, High Technology Research Associates or something like that, but quickly explain that that's just a cover and we're not surprised. We, that's what's known as a cutout, a, a, a shell corporation that they're using for uh, uh, you know, certain purposes, and uh, and they explain to us that. Um, uh, we are there. Two, we're down to two companies. Ours, which is a smaller company, and another large company. And one of the two companies is going to get. This is like on a Wednesday or Thursday. On Monday, one of these companies will be phone and get the contract, and we're in the running. Okay, that's exciting. Um, but then they explain that they're very embarrassed because we'll get a verbal okay on Monday if we if we win, but we'll have to start work right away to make the timing, and they won't be able to get paperwork to us for maybe 60 or 90 days. They're, they're embarrassed, but it, just, it takes that long to get the kind of paperwork we need. And so the problem is we're going to have to start on a verbal go-ahead before we have paper. And the problem with that is is that they looked at our financials, and we weren't that financially strong to undertake that kind of a commitment. And so that's why they wanted a banker there. And so they said, would, could the bank extend? We, I think we had a credit line in those days of, I think, $4.5 million. It would take another million and a half to make us presentable for this purpose. And... Uh, and, I, and so they asked the bank if the bank could increase our credit line for a million and a half. And the banker very naturally said, you don't tell us who you are, and you won't tell us what, you know, what it's all about. The answer is no. And so we're at a stalemate, because as it said, we're not, we, we, we wouldn't be qualified. And uh, I turned to the first, vice president of First Interstate Bank and says, you people have my personal financials. In those days, I had money. That's before I got in my project with the Russians. But anyway, um, that took me down. But the point is, in those days, I had a, a net worth. I said, you, you have a net worth. If I guaranteed the incremental loan, would the bank willing go along with this? And he said, I can't. He says he didn't have the authority, but we go downtown. He says that they'd probably go along with that. So I turned to the customer. I says, if I can pull that off in the next 24 hours, would that suffice? And they said, sure. So that's exactly what we did. I went downtown the next morning to First Interstate Bank. We signed some papers. And I guaranteed an additional an incremental million and a half on the on an existing four and a half million dollar loan on that Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. And that Monday, we did get a phone call, and we won this contract. And that was eight. It, it, it turned out to be the electronics for the B2. And uh, uh, it was um, 18 months later that that whole project got transferred to Northrop. But prior to that, it was in a in an organization whose existence is classified. And so. It, was, it startled me to discover that there's a whole procedure. There are uh, 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 cost uh, rec recovery procedures. There are courts. There's all kinds of all the necessary infrastructure to make this all work is in place. And it's all uh, highly classified to protect even the existence of the customer. It's the third level, if you will. You follow me? Well, one of the things that I want to, when you start talking about this, with that kind of a structure, how do you also really protect something that you're trying to keep secret? And one of the things you can do is have an active disinformation strategy. You not only keep it secret, you publish things to keep people from understanding what it is, discredited or whatever else. And we did that, for example, in the Manhattan Project during World War II. The very existence of our atomic, atomic bomb project, the so-called Manhattan Project, was hidden under a whole bunch of other cover stories and pseudo-projects. You went through certain doors, there were projects going on that really had nothing to do with anything, they were just a cover to hide what was really going on. Active disinformation. And one of the things I personally suspect is that's exactly what they did with MJ-12. It's very possible that they surface 
documents that have flaws in them, knowing that after a few months, few years, whatever, the diligence of researchers will discover that that couldn't have been that typewriter, that really isn't Truman's signature, whatever. So everybody knows that MJ-12 is just a big hoax. What a perfect cover. Ask anybody that's in this community about MJ-12, and they'll shrug it off right away. Oh, that's that, that hoax that surfaced in the 80s. Really. What a perfect cover. And obviously, if, uh, if I, I, I think it's real. I think it's continued. It obviously has gone under new names and so forth. But I suddenly began to realize that the debunking of MJ-12 may be very well. There's, there's a number of reasons I don't want to get into that caused me to suspect that that all was contrived. There have been some others like that, incidentally. So there's a continuing mystery. Why is somebody going to all this trouble to hide... For example, the Roswell stuff from uh, after 56 years, whatever it is, 57 years. Two presidents, four congressmen failed to penetrate the security surrounding the UFO-related issues. That's strange. By the way, a Canadian embassy inquiry was rebuffed in Washington, D.C. with the disclosure that the topic of UFOs enjoys a classification higher than our most secret warheads, the W-88s. They made an inquiry and they got turned down, but they made a mistake when they turned it down because they disclosed the fact that what they were after, which is some UFO information, was classified more highly than our weapon systems. Why? And uh, so, now by the way, just as we have Roswell in the United States, in England they have the famous Rendlesham Forest incident. And this is kind of interesting. On December 26th and 27th, the day after and then the next day of, of Christmas, in 1980, next, there was, there, there, there's a forest that's right next to a, a, a U.S. air base and a Royal Air, uh, air Base at Woodbridge in Suffolk, England. And in that forest, twice, two evenings in a row, a UFO landed. And... Uh, it was seen two nights into succession. It was tracked on radar by many of the military sites around there. Many people were involved. They rolled out uh, what they call light alls. That's like a, 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 draw, a, a car drawn trailer that has bright lights for various outdoor projects. They, they had that all set up when they landed. It was apparently scheduled somehow. And this was reported by Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt in a memo that was classified on both sides of the Atlantic. But a copy did get leaked out. And uh, the, so just as we have our Roswell mystery, in England they talk a lot about Reynolds and Forrest. What really happened there? There are lots of people involved, military, enlisted and others. So out of that have come all kinds of stories. Many of them are too afraid to even talk about it. Others that share incidents and they're very, just, just as there are bizarre tales about Roswell, there's even more bizarre tales about Reynolds and Forrest. Well, the good news is the UK government has announced the last few months that the Rendlesham file is going to be released. They're moving towards a Freedom of Information Act kind of posture, and apparently the Rendlesham Forest files, which have only been seen by about 20 people up until the release, and uh, so that's so for, there's, we're, in, we're moving into a day when some of these mysteries are going to be uh, revealed. Now, another thing that comes up when you talk about these topics are crop circles, and. Uh, and this might be a good ch chance for, the, for our TV people to change tapes if they want. So why don't I, let's take a five minute stretch break and let them collect themselves and we'll pick up crop circles and some subsequent things following, okay? Well, you can't talk about UFOs and that sort of thing without getting into the area of crop circles. And the recent movie Signs with uh, Mel Gibson is an example of that. It was a, a, a you know amalgam of, of urban legends. They used corn stalks. None of the crop circles have used corn stalks, incidentally, but that's trivial. The real thing is, what about these crop circles? Many of us have heard that they're just developed by pranksters. Pranks with planks is the way most people regard them. And indeed, that probably covers many of them. I think most of you can have seen various patterns that occur in crops, in, not just in England, by the way, all over the world. They have uh, showed up uh, uh, more and more in, with increasing... In fact, there are websites that just keep track of the various styles. They are in the thousands, by the way. These are just some representative shots of them. And uh, various patterns 
Uh, not all of them circular, by the way. But, um, uh, and of course, uh, many people associate these with UFOs. Many of these patterns have, there have been observers claim that been UFOs seen over the fields the, the, you know, the night before the crop circles are discovered, that sort of thing. So there seems to be, at least in the minds of many, an association between them. And, uh, but in 1991, two elderly artists, Doug Bauer and Dave Charlie, they came forward and uh, indicating, admitting that they had faked hundreds of these circles and they demonstrated their technique using ropes and planks uh, and, and, and tethers and so forth to, uh, to uh, do this. In fact, they did it under journalist supervision. In fact, in some of the TV specials, you can actually see time motion where they, they uh, uh, unveil how they pulled some of these off. And if that was just it, we would probably dismiss this as an incidental topic. But, um, uh, and it does appear, by the way, that there are many of these that have some form of craftsmanship that accounts for the thousands that appear throughout the world, not just in uh, Britain, in the United States too. But let me tell you frankly, that doesn't explain them all. There's also a group of scientists that have been studying this quite rigorously and are startled with what they find on some of these circles. There are articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals that have established that not all of these things are pranks with planks. For example, biophysicist William C. Levengood, he's of the Pinlandia Biophysical Laboratory in Michigan. Um, He's examined plants and soils from 250 crop formations, randomly selected from seven countries. And the samples and the controls of the handling of those samples were provided by the Massachusetts-based BLT research team directed by Nancy Talbot. Levengood, by the way, has published over 50 papers in scientific journals. And he's documented numerous changes in the plants and the formations, for example. Most dramatically, they found grossly elongated nodes, or like knuckles, along the stem that are apparently expulsion cavities caused by the heating of internal moisture from exposure to intense bursts of radiation. The only way they can explain them. They've also taken seeds from the plants and germinated them in a lab. It showed significant alterations in growth as compared to the control samples. And this has been published in the International Journal of European Societies of Plant Psychology back in 94. But it goes on and on. They find a brown glaze over some of the plants. It turns out it was pure iron that had been embedded in the plants while the iron was still molten. Tiny iron spheres were also found in the soil around those plants. And this was published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration in 1995. In 1999, a British investigator, Ronald Ashby, examined the glaze that we're talking about here through optical scanning electron, uh, optical and scanning electron microscopes. And he de determined that the intense heat had been involved about 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course would destroy the plants. And uh, there are hundreds of plant and soil samples were collected from a seven-circle barley formation in Edmonton, Canada. The plants had both elongated nodes and expulsion cavities that we talked about, and the soils contained these peculiar iron spheres. And the control showed that uh, none of these, in other words, control, plants that were not part of the circle did not have any of those changes. A mineralogist by the name of Sampath uh, Iyengar, Technology Materials Laboratory in California, examined specific heat-sensitive clay materials in these soils using X-ray diffraction and a scanning electron microscope. He discovered an increase in the degree of crystallinity uh, in the circle minerals in the, in the uh, soil. Statistician Ravi Raghavan determined a 95% statistically significant confidence level in these findings. They have no idea what's causing it. It's clear this was not just some contrived prank for some of them. And so on it goes. Now what was really astounding was the direct correlation between the node length increases in the plants and the increased crystallization in the soil minerals. What that implies is a common energy source for both effects. So somehow there was some very intense energy. This wasn't a couple of guys with planks and, and ropes playing games. And the scientists could not explain how this is possible because the temperature required to alter the soil crystallinity would be between 1500 and 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And this of course would destroy the plants. So how did this happen? They don't know. But there are journals and there are uh, scientists that are 
wrestling with the puzzles of the crop circles. Not the crop circles in general, those that turn out to be what we'll call real ones, not, not hoaxes. And that's the problem in any research area like this. You've got so much noise, uh, it's hard to find the signal, if you will. Well, let's get to the real core of all of this. What's the biblical view? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the days of Noah. You know, Jesus uh, gave four disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming. And uh, uh, the four disciples came to him to inquire his return, and he detailed the preceding events that would uh, occur prior to his second coming. And his answer to them, these four guys, is so important, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. But he opens and closes that briefing with a, a, a repeated admonition. Take heed that no man deceive you. And that occurs in Matthew 24, 4, and you'll find it's the theme of, of, of the, the entire presentation. We're dealing here in spiritual matters, and the attempt of the enemy will be to deceive us. But in the middle of this briefing, about verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes a very strange remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now in the context there, what he may have been alluding to is simply that it'll be business as usual until, uh, just it was business as usual until Noah and the ark, it'll be business as usual until he returns. And most people who read that passage assume that that's all he meant. It's just that it's going to come as a surprise. And yet there are many scholars from the context of the details of that passage feel he was giving us a hint of something deeper. And we really don't, won't understand what he's talking about unless we understand what the days of Noah were like. And so we're going to uh, try to figure out what, the, what did Jesus really mean? As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what you really need to do to get a handle on the UFO thing, strangely enough, is to do your homework in Genesis chapter 6. And I want, want you to notice the first two verses, and I want you to pay attention that the first two verses are a single sentence. Many people stumble because they don't realize that's a single sentence. Now you see why it kind of, what I'm getting at in a minute. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Benaiha Elohim, the sons of God, as it's translated, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. One verse. Now the question is, um, this strange phrase, sons of God, uh, that can mean anything to us. Let's find out what the text really means, sons of God. It, what it is in the Hebrew is, remember Hebrew goes from right to left, so if you're watching the slides here, uh, remember all languages go towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left, their language. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. So just breaking, so Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, uh, Sanskrit, whatever, they go right to left. Anyway, uh, so if you're reading the Hebrew here, recognize it goes from right to left. Bene ha Elohim, the, 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 the sons of the God. Now, sons of God, Bene ha Elohim is, is a term that's always used of a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I, in the natural, are not. We're sons of Adam. That's our problem. That's what the book of Romans is all about. And, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The term is, has technical meaning in the New Testament as well as the Old. In the Old Testament, this term in the Hebrew, in Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, uh, is always used of angels, because they are a direct creation of God. In the New Testament, also Luke 20.36. Also the book of Enoch, now I'm, don't misunderstand my use of this as a, as a citation here. The book of Enoch was very popular from about the 2nd century before Christ to the 2nd century after. It is not an inspired book, I wouldn't treat it that way, but it is useful in understanding the vocabulary and the grammar of the time. And clearly in the book of Enoch, it made, this term is used there also to refer to angels. And it deals with it greatly. The Septuagint, this is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures that went from Hebrew to Greek. If you were a, a Jew living 
in the time of, of uh, say, the uh, second century before Christ, the enforced language worldwide, the commercial language, was Greek. Thanks to Alexander the Great and following, uh, that was the common language. If you were a Jew uh, in business anywhere in the world, you had to speak Greek to survive. You may have known Hebrew for religious purposes, but Hebrew was to the Jew in those days what Latin is to a Catholic today, basically a language for religious purposes. So one of the things, if you were Jewish in those days, what you would have liked to have had is a copy of the, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, in Greek, so you could read it. And because of that, under Ptolemy Philadelphus, he funded the translation of the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek, started about 285 B.C., finished about 270 B.C., and the result of that work product, he got 70 of the top scholars, the word Septuagint is just 70, a uh, fancy word for, uh, Greek word for 70. He got the 70 top scholars to do the translation, took about 15 years, and uh, the result of that we have copies of, and it's known as the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. And so it gives us the benefit of the precision of Greek on some of these issues. So it's a very, very powerful uh, resource for scholars. And the Septuagint also makes it clear that we're dealing here with uh, uh, angels, as we think of them. Now in Genesis 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all whom they chose. The word sons of God, of course, is Benai Elohim, sons of God, direct creation, term for angels saw the daughters of men. Now, by the way, what that really says in the Hebrew is Benaf Adam, daughters of Adam. I mention this because there have been contrived some strange interpretations of this passage that are commonly taught in most seminaries. And it's tragic because there's a view of this passage that has no scriptural support. And we'll talk about that because you'll, you'll run into it. Many people think that, that uh, this is strange stuff. And it is strange. It's even stranger than most people realize. So... Um, now, when you get down to verse 4 of Genesis 6, it says, There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What this verse seems to indicate is that these Nephilim were offspring of a strange union. The sons of God, these are angels according to the Hebrew uh, uh, precision here. They came in unto the daughters of men. Daughters of Adam, incidentally. This is not just Cain and Seth and any of that. This is the daughter, these, these are daughters of men. And they bear children to them. It's those children that are the Nephilim. Now what on earth is the Nephilim? That word, Nephilim, is a key word. We're going to talk a lot about that. Nephilim means the fallen ones. It comes from the verb nafal, which means to fall, be cast down, to fall away, to desert. That's what a Nephilim is, a deserter, in a sense. What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race by cohabiting. I don't know the technology. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. But they apparently uh, uh, were... See, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's a, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. A third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes in, right? He's got to find a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, con, a, a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring of Nephilim, they're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And uh, now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants. And it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantis comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. And uh, so let's keep that in mind. The fact that they were giants is like a pun. Yes, they were giants, but that's not what the word means. It carries a different meaning. 
Let's go on a little further in verse 9 of Genesis 6. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Terrific verse. We've all read it. But most of us may not pay attention to what that's really saying. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does that mean? Well, the word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. What it means is without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. What that verse seems to indicate is that Noah's genealogy was unblemished. Now this comes on right after the verses that talk about these strange goings on where these fallen angels are, have created some weird form of hybrid. But Noah was unblemished in his generations, and that's one of the reasons that God chose Noah and his three sons and their four wives to start over again. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. <laughs> No, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God is a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now, by the way, if, if this view is correct, I'm presenting to you what's sometimes called the angel view of Genesis 6. That is not taught in most seminaries. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if that view is correct, as I've suggested from the exegesis of the Hebrew in Genesis 6, it will be confirmed in the New Testament, at least twice, and it is. When you get to the book of Jude, Jude makes an allusion to this very event in Jude verses 6 and 7. Jude is just one chapter. But in verses 6 and 7, Jude writes, And the angels, and by the way, this is in the Greek, so it's not ambiguous. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is talking about judgment on the bad guys. And he mentions among these things, these angels which sinned back in Genesis 6. These angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains. These angels that participated in Genesis 6 apparently are chained awaiting a special judgment. We'll talk, it's going to, uh, Peter's going to talk about that in a minute. And he even, he even he, uh, uh, Jude asks, adds something else here. He makes a comparison between the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of these angels in that they were doing that which is unnatural. Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. We're all familiar with that. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He's using that as an additional exemplar, lumping the angels with him. The angels went after strange flesh, so did the Sodom and Gomorrah. They're both reserved for special judgment. You follow me? You can read it, check it out yourself. That's one confirmation. That's in Jude. Let's take a look at, uh, it, see, they left their own habitation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And going after strange flesh is the, is the illusion here. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Second Peter, in Peter's second letter he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, it's translated hell in your English Bible, but the Greek word is Tartarus, and it's the only place that word appears in the Bible. I'll come back to that. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved on judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. So Peter does a couple of things here. He again alludes to the angels that sinned, they're cast into Tartarus, that's a, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, and they're reserved unto, for a final judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. In other words, he ties that event to the days of Noah. So he not only confirms Genesis 6, but he also links it to the days of Noah. Okay. The word Tartarus deserves some comment. The problem with this word is it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, but it does appear in Greek literature. It's the Greek term for the dark abode of woe. It is the pit of darkness in the unseen world. 
It shows up, in, for example, in Homer's Iliad, where Tartarus is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So where is Tartarus? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. So Tartarus was a term for a deep, special... It, is so, it, it was regarded as, as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So it's, it's where these angels are chained until, until the final thing. Now, if you study Greek, classic Greek mythology, you run into the titans. These, these creatures in, their myth, in the legends and the myth, myths were partly terrestrial and partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned where? Into Tartarus. Do you see a parallel brewing here? I'm going to suggest to you that the legends of the ancient Greeks embody the truth of what really happened in the past, that there were these strange creatures generating hybrids that the Greek called Titans. And we see Zeus in many forms. We see, we see uh, Atlas and Hercules. Atlas and Hercules from, from Greek mythology were what would be called in the Hebrew Nephilim, offspring of an intermarriage between a god and a woman. And uh, so, now these legends, we, we obviously we see in the Sumer culture, in Assyria, in Egypt, I'll show you a few things, in the Incas, the Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh in the Persian mythology, and certainly in the Greek mythology, which most of us as products of Western civilization are familiar with, also in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands. Every one of these cultures, including the American Indians, every one of these cultures have legends of the star people. These people that came, these gods or demigods, whatever, came and cohabited with women and produced, a, produced hybrids. I discover from some uh, apparent experts in the American Indian culture that this business of holding a hand up saying how, that's Hollywood. Uh, but what apparently was the practice when they met a stranger was to hold up the hand so they could count fingers. They had a terror of the six-fingered people. And if you go to uh, the ruins at Chaca, New Mexico, one, they have a, one of the exhibits there that you want to take a look at are the famous pictographs. And among those pictographs you'll find the, the fearsome six-fingered hand as part of that. The, I came across something else that's kind of the Pawnee Indians have an account that Bill, you remember uh, Buffalo Bill, real name was William Cody. He wrote his autobiography in 1920. Very colorful guy. You can get his book, it's popular. But there's an interesting quote in his book by, Bill, by Buffalo Bill, Bill Cody, uh, published in 1920. He says, While we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Niobara uh, country, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day. And they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. It's in his autobiography. It's published in 1920. Uh, I don't think he was worried about UFOs and stuff, but you, it is an uh, interesting allusion to the Indian, Indian lessons. Uh, in the uh, early country, uh, Asher, they, ha they always speak of the flying god of Asher. And this diagram you see in many, many of the ancient uh, monuments of uh, a man with a bow, like Nimrod perhaps, and, uh, the, uh, and the wings. Uh, and you see this on the monuments. Here's an example of them. As you go through Egypt, this is a, a, a snapshot in one of the tombs. Of, I think it's Ramesses II, but you see in all of them. You'll notice on the headers of these, uh, uh, of these passages, again you see a, uh, uh, the wing, a flying disc again and again and again uh, as you go through Egypt. You look at the, the headers on uh, many of these monuments. You look up there and you always see the flying disc, sometimes with a snake involved. And uh, you see it again and again and again. Sometimes you see uh, uh, a person involved with these and you even find the disc being transported from place to place. So this seems to be something more than simply a symbol of a um, of, a, of a, some icon that they're worshipping. 
Well, you say, gee, Chuck, this angel view is kind of strange. I hadn't heard of that before. You know, I, when, when, our, when our book was published, I got, the, I got telephone calls from top executives of some of the Christian publishers that were angry, not at me, at their seminary background, because many of them are graduates of, of, of seminaries, and they were never taught the angel view. And uh, that's disturbing. You may not agree with it, but it still should be taught as one of the alternative views. What most people have taught, and you'll find it in many Bible handbooks, stuff, the so-called lines of Seth view. The idea that we're the sons of God really refers to the, 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 the line of Seth, the leadership of the line of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain, not Seth. And the sin that uh, is, is dominant there is their failure to maintain separation, is the concept. Now, it doesn't explain how the offspring of these unions resulted in these strange creatures. You know, if you have a believer and unbeliever marry, they may have monsters, but not, they're not monstrous. Okay. Um, this whole view of the so-called lines of Seth emerged in the 5th century in the early church. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief. See, this belief that I've shown you was taught by the ancient rabbis in, in the Old Testament period and also taught by the early church up through the 5th century. But Julian, uh, Celsus and uh, uh, Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief to attack Christianity. They made fun of these people who thought the angels had so forth. They attacked it. Julius Africanus resorted to this Sethite idea as a more comfortable ground. It's more, people find that more, less spooky. And uh, it just, uh, Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position. Augustine comes along, who was a profound influence, and he did many, many great things. He dealt with a number of heresies, but he embraced the Sethite series, and that, of course, uh, made it uh, orthodox. And so this view of this line of Seth prevailed all through the medieval church. It isn't until you go back to the text and do your homework that you begin to realize that the line of Seth has absolutely no scriptural support. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That, that, that's contrived. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. The sons of God are not the sons of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam were not just the daughters of Cain. They were both. It was, uh, that if you recognize, recognize the first two verses are one sentence, a lot of that becomes very obvious. And if, if there's daughters of men, where are the daughters of Elohim? There's, if there's sons of Elohim, where's the daughters of Elohim? See, you're sort of wondering, what, what, there's no mention of that. The grammatical antithesis is ignored, and I won't get into that here, but this idea of maintaining separation doesn't occur until chapter 11 of Genesis, not 6, it's five chapters later that we have the Babel and all of that. The separation is imposed upon Isaac and his following, not on Ishmael and the others. It was Isaac and Jacob that were told to keep themselves separate. And that was not imposed on Seth and Cain. That's all contrived. In fact, Genesis 6 verse 12 says, All flesh was corrupted. So the idea that lines of Seth were the good guys, and the line of Cain was the bad guys, is contrived. That's not what it's all about. See, the inferred godliness of Seth is contrived. Why was only Enoch and Noah's eight spared? Were they only good guys? No, it's God's grace, of course. They took wives that they chose, implies some forcing functions here. And if that's all, if, they, if Seth were such good guys, why did they perish in the flood? Doesn't, see, it doesn't, doesn't compute. And uh, it, Enosh, it was incidentally Enosh's Seth's son that initiated the defiance of God. Most people don't realize that because of mistranslation. Genesis 4.26 should read, Then men began to profane, not call upon, profane the name of the Lord. So renders the Targum of Onkelos, the Targum of Jonathan, the major Hebrew rabbis, Eckhart Rashi, uh, Maimonides, and the rest, and of course, Jerome. So, the daughters of Cain, this, this is not a subset of the daughters of Adam, there's no basis for that. And the Cainites were not necessarily godless. You know, I've always wondered in Genesis 4, why we have the genealogy of Cain. Because they're going to all perish in the flood. Why does the scripture give us the genealogy? Well, there may be other reasons, but one reason is, if you read the names, you'll find the name of God in them. You get the impression that Cain messed up, killed his brother, yes, but he raised his kids and grandchildren to worship God. He was a godly guy, and the names reveal that. So the idea that daughter, the, the, you know, the, the descendants of Cain were bad guys is, is a contrivance of modern scholarship. And why are they just daughters of Cain? Were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? What's the deal here? So that's, of course... And, of course, the, the, the death knell to this theory is that the, 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 the unnatural offspring. What were the Nephilim then? See, the, they, they were supernatural offspring, the mighty men, the Geberim. Does that mean only X chromosomes among the Sethites? There are no women of renown recorded. 
And, and what really made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? It wasn't contaminated by this, this, these goings on. And as I pointed out, we have these New Testament confirmations. We looked at several of them, and I won't get into that here. The angel view was the traditional rabbinical view in the Old Testament. The Book of Enoch is just an example of their belief system, uh, emphasizes that. The Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs, these are not inspired books, but they do reflect the thinking of the times. Jose Josephus clearly uh, understood this. The Septuagint clearly spells it out. The Church Fathers in the first few centuries, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, all taught this. Modern scholarship, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur Pink, Donald Barnhouse, who I respect highly, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, terrific scholar, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, others. Modern scholarship recognizes the angel view. The Sethite view is uh, the text itself destroys it, the inferred separation is nonsense, the inferred godliness is contrived, the inferred Canaanite substitute of the Adamites is not contrived. All this is contrived. The unnatural offspring implied is the death knell to the view in my opinion. Of course, the New Testament, Jude and Second Peter, nail it. But there's another issue as I got into this, not just for this study. It's important for us to understand that the Nephilim were not confined before the flood. We don't know how they came about, but they were Nephilim after the flood. When, Josh, when uh, Moses sends in the twelve tribes, in Numbers 13, verse 33, they encountered the Nephilim in the, in the land. Who built the pyramids? Let's see another quick ancillary question here. Who built the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stonehenge in Britain, and the circle of the Rephaim in the Golan. And uh, they're up in the Golan Heights, there's an unexplored monument we discovered uh, up there that is called the Gilgal Rephaim. This is, who are the Rephaim? And uh, the, the circle of Rephaim is five circles, 20 ton stones about 155 meters in diameter, dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. And by the way, you can only detect its architecture from above, strangely, and so forth. Um, there's, there's some others, too, that are, if you fly over that area, you see the hints of others. These have never been explored. And uh, the point I want to get across, it's, it, it startled me to realize that this is not simply a study in Old Testament ancient history. It is essential to understand, if you're going to understand your Bible, understand prophecy. You need to understand there were, there were Nephilim, Nephilim after the flood. In Genesis 4 it says there were, there were um, Nephilim in those days and also after that. It even hints at it right there. In Genesis 14 and 15 we discover there are four tribes at least. The Rephaim, the Emim, the Harim, and the Zamzumim. That Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child. Boy, that sounds like genocide. It was. Because we had the same thing, not a flood this time, it was a local situation. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, are talked about not just in the Bible, but also in Egypt, by the way. They were encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13.33, when the, when the uh, twelve spies went. The, when they came back, the, Joshua and Caleb had the good report. The other ten guys said, hey, there's Nephilim in the land. That's the word they used. They were giants. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. That's not an exaggeration. They had reason to be terrified. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had uh, faith in God. We're, you know, God's on our side, let's go. But, uh, and it's easy to disparage the other ten guys. You need to understand they had, on the one hand, some reason to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12, we encounter Og, the king of Bashan. He's the king of the giants, the Rephaim. Goliath, remember, he had f four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Why? He was ready for all five of those guys. See, one of the things you can go through the whole Bible and study the Bible in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And when God indicates that, the, that, it's, that the, his redemptive plan is going to come from the seed of the woman, he starts attacking Adam's line in Genesis 6 with the, with the Rephaim, which of course, I mean with the Nephilim. And that's uh, God's response, of course, to the flood. Genesis 12. When God calls Abraham, now Abraham is singled out. As God refines the visibility more precisely of how his plan is going to work, it allows Satan to focus his attack. When Abraham's called, Abraham gets singled out for Satan's uh, uh, mischief. The famine in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line in Exodus 1, Satan's attempt to thwart the... Even when they get out, Pharaoh's pursuit of, uh, of in the Exodus. It was... Um, now, when God calls Abraham, he tells Abraham in Genesis 17, 15 and 17, 
that there, the, he's going to leave there, and four centuries later, his descendants will come. Well, that lets Satan know he's got four centuries to lay down a minefield. And that's what we're dealing with here in the Rephaim in the land. And when God calls David in 2 Samuel 7, allows Satan to focus on David. And uh, the attacks on David's line. Jerome kills his brothers in 2 Chronicles 21. The Arabians slew everyone but one, Azariah. Uh, uh, Athaliah kills all but Joash in 2 Chronicles 22. Every, every time there's an attempt to wipe out all the royal line, some servant hides a baby, whatever, there's always, uh, it slips through. And uh, Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 and 38, another example. When you get to the Persian period, here's Haman trying to wipe all the Jews. Wipe out all the Jews. And uh, uh, that's Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And had it not been for Mordecai and Esther, he, it, would, it would seem he might have succeeded. And uh, New Testament strategies. Remember Joseph's fear when he found out Mary was pregnant. He was going to put her away privately. God says, no, no, don't do that. That's part of my program. Herod's attempt when he wipes out all the babes in Bethlehem. It's Satan's attempt to wipe out God's plan at, at, when they, at Nazareth in Luke 4 when Jesus uses Isaiah as his mandate for his ministry, Isaiah 61, we've got to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. In Mark 4 and Luke 8, there are storms at sea, and I think they're both supernatural ones. That's why got, uh, Jesus rebuked the sea and so on. And of course, the ultimate thwart was the cross. The cross. And this, this is all summarized in Revelation chapter 12. You can study it there carefully. But the main point of all of this is that Satan is not finished yet. And that may be what the UFOs are, are, are a preamble to. By the way, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? They're in the news day all the time, right? These are the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim. The word Rephaim means the dead, the walking dead. Isaiah 26.14 says they cannot be resurrected. These are strange creatures. And uh, it's interesting if you study the strongholds uh, that uh, they fail to defeat, you'll notice that those same regions are the territories, the so-called West Bank, that are in dispute today. I think that's fascinating. The, the Joshua's, not Joshua, but his, his descendants failed to deal with these issues, and they plagued them to this very day. The Golan was called uh, Bas the Bashan, and it's just when Jesus is hanging on the cross in Psalm 22, verse 12, he says a strange thing. He says, Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. I have no idea what that means, but I suspect he's not talking about cattle. I think he's talking about some kind of demon oppression that's involved. I think it's, a, and it's an allusion to the Rephaim. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of angels, because that's really at the root of this problem. You notice, we learn a lot about angels by looking at the Bible. They always appear in human form. They look human. In fact, many people entertain them unaware, as we find out. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the homosexuals were after them. That tells you something. I don't want to be too graphic here. And at the resurrection, and at the ascension, there's always a pair of angels. And they're like men. They look like men standing here. They spoke. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them. They're capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was there by a death angel. In the in, uh, book of uh, 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 Second Kings, uh, slaughter of the 185,000 Syrians. One angel after night slaughters 185,000 Syrians. You don't mess around with angels. Now, and they don't marry in heaven. Now that, that, that's a phrase, by, and by the way, I'm making a contrast here with the demons of the New Testament are not like this. They apparently are powerless except to the extent they can embody some person. They're not like angels. Don't think, distinguish between fallen angels, the bad guys, and the demons. The demons apparently are disembodied spirits looking for embodiment. The angels don't have that problem. They apparently can materialize. All the way through the scripture we see them that way. We do know they don't marry. As, can, the question everybody has is, can angels have sex? The, the scripture says no. No, it doesn't say that. Jesus says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's talking about uh, 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 that in a resurrection bodies, we don't have sex because we, we're immortal. There is no procreation. There is no uh, reproduction issue. And angels, in, he's talking here about the angels of God in heaven. I would not speculate on the technologies available to an angel who falls. And that's what we're dealing with here. 
Now, there's a strange word that gets overlooked by the scholars uh, in general, and, and I've, I've participated in some translation issues on this very issue. There's a word called oketerion, and it refers to the body as the dwelling place for the spirit. It only occurs twice in the scripture, and it's very interesting where it does. It occurs in Jude 6, and it's the word that describes what the fallen angels disrobed from. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it speaks of, uh, it alludes to the heavenly body that you and I as believers aspire to be clothed in. Same word, okay, I think it's a technical term that's overlooked by the scholars. In uh, June 6 and 7, it says, When the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation, that word habitation is okaterion. They disrobed from the, 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 the body that they were given to indulge in this mischief in Genesis 6. The angels which kept not their first estate but left their ha own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness in the ju judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth, we went through that before. The word is Okaterian. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, Paul tells the Corinthians, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. The word translated house is Okaterion. That which those angels abandon is what we aspire to, that kind of, that kind of a, uh, a habit, if you will. Okaterian again. Anyway, let's talk about something else we talked about earlier and mentioned earlier we should get into. Alien abductions. You know, the disturbing thing is there's continuing a deluge of cases being reported that are too weird, too bizarre to take seriously on the one hand, but they're too frequent and too consistent to ignore. And uh, estimates of 1 to 3 percent of our population have been reported in the professional journals. They, all the strange episodes seem to involve the implanting or the harvesting of human fetuses as a primary topic. It seems that if these creatures are real, they're very preoccupied with the human reproductive process. And that causes us to wonder, could this be leading to a repetition of the strange events of Genesis 6? Is it possible? that this is the hint that is included in Jesus' remark, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Dr. John Max, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, MD, he, uh, uh, head of psychiatry for uh, Harvard's uh, uh, hospital there, and uh, he's written on this area. He says, the idea that men and women and children can be taken against their wills from their homes, cars, or schoolyards by strange humanoid beings lifted into spacecraft and subjected to intrusive and threatening procedures is so terrifying and yet so shattering to our notions of what is possible in our universe that the actuality of the phenomenon has been largely rejected out of hand or bizarrely distorted in most media accounts. This is altogether understandable given the disturbing nature of UFO abductions and our prevailing notions about reality. The fact remains, however, that for 30 years and possibly longer, Thousands of individuals who seem to be sincere and of sound mind and who are seeking no personal benefit from their stories have been providing to those who will listen consistent reports of precisely such events. By the way, John Mack has personally dealt with 76 cases himself. He's profiled others. These are people above average intelligence with no prior psychiatric history that clearly are subject to some kind of trauma. And there was a, a, a conference on this abduction phenomenon at MIT. And John Mack was one of the co-chairmen of that conference. And he says, if what these abductees are saying is happening to them isn't happening, what is? He's saying, what's, what's really going on here? Here's Mack's challenge to the professionals that were there assembled. The high degree of consistency of the stories, the absence of any prior psychiatric illness, the physical changes in lesions. Some of these people have scars from the procedures, and I've encountered one myself on that independently witnessed by others while the abductions are taking place. There's not many, but there are a few. The involvement of small children is disturbing. Not likely they could be conditioned by, you know, the... Well, let's move on. The coming to cosmic deception, what's the biggest lie of all? You know, it's interesting. This all started back in Genesis 3. 
When God declared war on Satan, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody, and from this verse we get one of the messianic titles of Christ, the seed of the woman. What many people overlook, there's two seeds mentioned here. The other seed is the seed of the serpent. And so we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent, we find all kinds of idioms, the red dragon in, in, in Revelation 12, the coming world leader, as I sometimes call him, the false prophet in Revelation 13. These forces are still at work and behind the world powers today. Check out Daniel 10 and really understand what's going on there. All of us have studied Daniel 2 and the, the sequence of nations, or empires I should say, that were re-echoed in Daniel 7, the winged lion, bear on one side, the leopard, the terrible beast, the ten heads. Uh, again, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome 1 and 2. Uh, we've been through that in our st prophetic studies and most people recognize the iron, iron mixed with clay is is the Roman Empire, don't confuse that with Western Europe, the Roman Empire, uh, part one and part two. Well, we live in a world, what's, what's going on in this world? There's a new world order, a world without borders is the concept, the end of the independent nation state, multiculturalism is in, check your faith at the door, we're going to all compromise. And this is all heading for a centralized socialistic government, and there are a couple of forcing functions, every freedom loving per person considers this an anathema, except the problem is there's no way to avoid it. Nuclear proliferation is part of it. We're on the threshold right now of nuclear war because of this very issue. But there's another forcing function that nobody talks about. The possibility, ultimately, not yet, but coming, of cosmic threat of some kind. You say, Chuck, that's way out. That's fringe stuff. Really? Um, let's talk about the miry clay. You know, Daniel, in Daniel's famous vision of the metal, multi-metal image, the last phase was, of course, the iron mixed with clay, the ten toes. What is miry clay? Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust, if you will. And everybody talks about the, 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 the clay in, in, in the ten toes of Daniel's imagery. No one, I'm, I'm guilty too, paid any attention to Daniel's explanation of it. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, he's explaining the whole thing. He's interpreting the vision for you. When he gets to this, in verse 43, he says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave to one another and so on. You know, that phrase, I read that a hundred times over the last thirty years and didn't hit me until uh, this in-depth study. Um, they, the, the miry clay refers to a they, it's a personal pronoun, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle themselves with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or it makes no grammatical or, or logical sense. So the they that are going to do the mingling are not the seed of men. Oh, could this be a hint of some mischief in the end times analogous to the uh, uh, mischief in Genesis 6? I think so. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Boy, there it, stare, it stares at me. Well, speaking of UFOs in the end times, you know, I remember uh, Walter Martin, I was on his board for many years, I, uh, my partner and I were the guys that brought him to the West Coast, and we, we because of his very, very critical ministry, uh, uh, you know, ministry to, in comparative religions, we try to keep him off this subject because we felt it would discredit his ministry. Uh, I don't hesitate these days for two reasons. One is I've got nothing to lose. My ministry is probably discredited anyway. Uh, but also the times are a little more uh, lucid these days. But in any case, I can remember Walter it, it, using any excuse. He would get to Luke 21, 26, and he'd quote this, men's heart failing them for fear for, and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And whenever he did that, he always gestured with his hand. Men's hearts failing themselves for fear and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he would he'd make sort of an inverted saucer with his hand as it was landing. He'd, say, Come in, and he'd just gesture with it. He, he saw UFOs here. And for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And I'm not to say he's wrong, but we used to always smile. Walter, get off that subject. Anyway, uh, but the coming great deception, Jesus opens and closes his Matthew 24 thing. He says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Insomuch that, that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. What's going to protect you? Your intellectual background? Your knowledge of physics? No way. No way. If it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The only thing, the only thing that can save you from this deception is your spiritual condition by being in Christ. They shall show great signs and wonders. They're going to do things that are going to uh, uh, violate apparent, our apparent knowledge of reality. We get to 2 Thessalonians, Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 has a lot to say about this. He says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. 
And then shall the wicked one be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wicked one is going to do miracles. Be prepared for some political leader to raise people from the dead. We're not ready for that. The mystery, see, I think the restrainer is restraining far more than you and I have any idea. I, more than we have capacity to imagine. I think after the rapture, it's going to get so strange, it's going to be way out there. Now, where does this wicked one come from? It surprises many to realize the scripture tells us in Revelation 11 and Revela Revelation 17. Revelation 11, verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Where is this guy coming from? From out of the abuso. So he's not just some political leader that happens to be kind of gifted. No, this guy is empowered by Satan himself. And he's coming out of the abuso himself. You get to Revelation 17. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, and they that dwell among the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. The only thing that can protect you from all of this is your position in Christ. Second Thess Second Thessalonians goes on, and because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Don't assume that if you that you can get saved after the rapture. People will be saved after the rapture. But if you've had an opportunity and turned down the redemption of Christ, this is what it's talking about. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Be careful. Don't play that game. If you're going to accept Christ, do it now. Don't wait, or you'll be vulnerable to the big deception. Now, the most absurd war is coming. I always fascinate with Psalm 2, which is a dialogue among the Trinity. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And it goes on. This whole idea that the world is going to take up arms against um, take up arms against God himself astonishes me I can understand people not believing God or rejecting God yes I can't imagine going after him warfare it just doesn't make sense why would the world go after him? I think I, I think I think the uh, Nephilim thing will explain it you know, it's interesting that the alien types, if you read all, you go through, you wallow through all this literature, Dr. Mark Eastman and I have spent a lot of time this, going through that stuff, you'll discover there's three types of these so-called alien creatures that emerge. The greys, those are the diminutives, short, you always see them in the, in the, in the entertainment media. There's another group that seem to appear, called, but sometimes called the Nordics or the Palladians. They, they, they're it's about six foot tall, they're blonde, blue eyed, they look like people. Could be around us now. And there's a third group that are the most grotesque of them all, what they're sometimes called the reptilians. These are scaly, weird creatures that look like a refuge from some grade B science fiction movie. There's weird stuff. Well, these three always, these always show up. It's interesting, in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, I've always wondered, how does the world go to war against God? And John tells us, I saw three unclean spirits like what? Like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. I think God is going to use some kind of strange creatures, demonic or whatever, to draw the world into this confrontation that is part of the, 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 the climax that Revelation and the Old Testament deal with. Well, what's our challenge, you and I? Let's wrap it up. I'm going to give you a statement that I want you to challenge. Don't accept what I say or you flunk. I want you to challenge what I'm about to say, although I believe it sincerely. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. But I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the whole gospel period. Now we monitor and, and publish uh, backgrounders and uh, weekly updates on 10 strategic trends and uh, we continue on our website and in our publications. There are major prophetic themes about Israel, about Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, about Babylon, 
about the coming invasion of the Middle East by Russia, Magog, if you will, the rise of China as a superpower, the decline of the United States, what I'll call the American challenge, the European superstate that's emerging, the move towards an ecumenical religion while all this is going on as the Pope embraces Islam, <laughs> global government as we see the nations struggle to, to, uh, in that direction, and there's a, uh, there is a, a, uh, another trend called the rise of the occult and UFOs. Watch for it. Now the ultimate issue, of course, is none of this. The ultimate issue is that you and I are in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin, and it's the only competent source to deal with these extraterrestrial issues. And this, this record, we call the Bible, portrays us as the objects of an unseen warfare. And our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of that cosmic conflict. Where do you stand? What is your readiness for this encounter? And you can't protect yourself with your intellect. You can't protect yourself with your knowledge base in the traditional sense. It's a spiritual battle, and you need to understand that. Paul tells us that in, Rome, in Ephesians 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And what's your remedy? Your spiritual armor. Ephesians 6 details seven elements of armor should be girded with truth. Take on the breastplate of righteousness. The feet, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take your shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. And uh, don't forget your heavy artillery prayer. Now each one of these is, uh, is part of your spiritual armor. And twice Paul emphasized put on the whole armor of God, not just your favorite pieces. To do that you've got to know what these are. And you need to do a very in-depth study of each of these six elements, and obviously, I should say seven elements. Um, uh, we don't have time to do that here, but we, I urge you to make a commitment to do a serious study of these things. And don't forget the seventh. Many people stop at verse 17. Don't go to verse 18. All right, we have a 24-hour hotline to the throne room of the universe, and he's anxious to hear from us. And we call it prayer. That's your heavy artillery. Keep that in mind. Now, these strategic trends.